a person's true potential is unknown and unknowable. It is impossible to foresee what can be accomplished with years of passion, toil, and training. The planet is falling apart. And the reason why the planet is falling apart is because we are consuming recklessly. Okay? And when you look at what is causing carbon, what's causing carbon is very simple. It's more people consuming more. And, you know, we can't necessarily change the course of the planet, but you can start making better choices as an individual. You're living on borrowed time. So now that's true. Even at 20, you don't know how long you're going to live. But certainly at 60, better start optimizing for time. So don't postpone doing the things that are important. Don't postpone doing things that you enjoy. You know, live life fully every day. Hey, my dear listeners, Inspire Someone today is back with yet another inspirer. All of us, those who have been to the business schools, have learned of what is called as S-curves. S-curves, where organizations are told to reinvent themselves to get on to more market share by following the S-curve. And with us today is somebody who has defined S-curves for himself in the personal and professional arena. Somebody who has given us answers for the question, what the heck do I do with my life? I'm sure all of us had moments of those questions coming at us. So it's my great privilege and honor to introduce Ravi Venkateshan on Inspire Someone today. Ravi, welcome to IST. Hey, Shri I'm delighted to be in conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. It's a great honor for me and my listeners to hear you out, to hear your rich experiences uh, that you've had. I'll start with this question. I'll not talk about your backstory, but talk to you about one particular incident that kind of shaped your overall thought process. So like this ancient Greek sculpture who fell in love with the sculpture that he was doing and that rock or the statue came to life, and it went on to become what is called as the Pygmalion effect. And something similar to this happened to you. You had your own Pygmalion effect growing up. What was it, if you can share that, and how that shaped Ravi, the person that he is today? Yeah, that's a good place to start. So for uh, listeners who haven't heard about the Pygmalion effect, right, it's simply, you know, the phenomenon where we rise or fall to meet the expectations of people. Right. So if you if somebody has high expectations of you, then you tend to rise up. And if somebody has low expectations, then you try and meet that too. So I think this is a very, very powerful effect in all our lives. And certainly it's been transformational for me. And perhaps the incident you're referring to is uh, the one from my childhood. Yeah, I had a very difficult start in life in the sense I was uh, very mediocre in everything, sports, academics, in my social skills. I was introverted, lacking self-confidence, etc., all the way till about Sikandar. And then I had a fantastic teacher who I'll never forget, Mrs. Malotra, and she was in Chandigarh where I was studying. And one day she said, oh, Ravi, I think you're going to be a great scientist. And not only did she tell me, she told everybody. And Shrikant, the thing is, at that point, there was no evidence at all that I was going to be great at anything, let alone science. But, you know, I was young and I wanted to not disappoint her. So I started studying really hard and miraculously started doing better and better, you know, give it better and better marks and grades. And that was a turning point in my life because with that came self-confidence, with that came, you know, respect of other, you know, kids in school, you know, more love and respect from my parents and relatives. And that put me on a path to everything that I was able to then over the years accomplish. And that was just the start. When I look back at, you know, my whole life, there have been other people who from time to time came into my life and showed great and in some cases, unwarranted belief and confidence. And again, you know, things worked out. So for instance, my first two managers, after I started working in the company, which, you know, where I worked then called Cummins Engine Company, gave me extraordinary opportunities. They gave me opportunities that I was completely not ready for. So at 28, I was running a huge factory in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. At 32, I came back to India and I became managing director of a very large joint venture with Tata Motors. And 
I was completely not ready for these experiences, but somebody believed I would do okay. And I worked damn hard to make sure I didn't let them down. And it worked out. Then later, it was even stranger. I had an opportunity to interview with um, Microsoft and Bill Gates was on the interview list. And that's the only reason I even showed up for the interview. And I told Bill very frankly, look, Bill, the least qualified person for this job being Microsoft India, because I don't even do email. The only reason I came is because I'll get to see you. So he laughed and he said, well, I hope you learn quickly. But they gave me the job and I tried to again do a, as best as I could. Then years later, Raghuram Rajan asked me to be chairman of Bank of Baroda. Again, nothing would have said I'm suited for that. So this Pygmalion effect has been a huge part of my life, personally, professional success story. My wife, for instance, has been an enormous, enormous pillar of support for all these big risks I took from time to time. And she never doubted I would make a success of it. I think I'm very lucky. Not everybody has people who have, you know, this sort of faith in what they will be able to accomplish. And I just wish more people were as lucky. And in itself, he's a great story out there that how one positive stroke like that can transform an individual, be it personally or professionally. Totally. And therefore, look, the only thing you can do is show confidence in other people. In fact, I begin my book which is called What the Heck Do I Do With My Life, as you said, uh, with a quote here. It's by Carol Dweck, the psychologist, you know, the, and she, she's written that growth mindset stuff. And it starts by the saying, a person's true potential is unknown and unknowable. It is impossible to foresee what can be accomplished with years of passion, toil, and training. So we all have incredible potential, but a little bit of encouragement and confidence and belief from a few others around us goes a long way in achieving that. Absolutely. And Ravi, along that time, you did take on multiple roles. You did mention about your stint at Microsoft, your stint at Bank of Baroda, and you also started off at Cummins, right? So from a manufacturing setup to information technology in the form of Microsoft, to a bank and now successfully leading social enterprises. How did you prepare for each of these roles in completely different sectors, segments, and prepare yourself to do well in each of these? Yeah, well, one thing is I never planned all this. Okay, as Steve Jobs says, you can connect the dots looking backwards. You, it's hard to connect. Serendipity the happened. Yeah, so I wouldn't say that I had planned that to do all these terrific things. They were opportunities that came along. But you're right. In some ways, you know, I had prepared, not exactly for these things, but I'd prepared. That's what I write about a lot in my book. The point I make in my book is, look, whatever I've done seems kind of pretty exceptional today, but it's going to become more and more the norm as we go forward because the world is becoming more unstable, much more fluid and therefore many of us are going to have to make such many more such transitions all of us are going to sooner rather than later become self-employed or an entrepreneur etc etc so my whole book is devoted to answering your question so the short answer to your question is go read the book dear listener but to elaborate or unpack that a bit you know i talk about the importance of things like you know, this certain sk- mindset, like the growth mindset, certain skills, like learning agility or entrepreneurial mindset, etc. I talk about the importance of building your networks, the importance of mentors, the importance of beha- cultivating intentionally a personal reputation. So these things you have to do, and they're called the intangible assets. And the Importance of these intangible assets, Srikanth, is that they make you more portable. Okay, so you can actually go from place to place, from opportunity to opportunity in a very, very seamless way if you've built the right mindset, right skills, right reputation, etc. And I think I did a better job than many people. And what happened as a result was opportunities came to me. I never went out looking for them. And this is a key point. You know, I think it is completely a failing strategy to go out chasing opportunities, applying for jobs. What you want to do is work on these things I talked about and attract opportunities to you. Employers should come chasing you. Venture capitalists should come. Investors should come chasing you, et cetera, et cetera, rather than the other way. So 
all the roles I got and took on over time are things that came into my life, not things that I've made happen or chased down. So, you know, the short answer is go work on build, you know, accomplishing great things, take on new big challenges every few years, use these crucible experiences to build your skills, build your professional reputation, intentionally work on expanding your networks. And if you do these things, then you're going to be a, you know, pretty good shape and amazing, amazing opportunities, which you cannot even dream of will come into your life. Sure. We will definitely devote some time on the book that you have written, Ravi. Again, I'll go back to this uh, point of you playing your role in multiple uh, industries, multiple spectrums. What are the challenges of operating in each of them, manufacturing to IT to banking? Where do you see as challenges as a professional taking on these roles? And did you have any self-doubt at any point of time? So the answer to the second question is absolutely. You always have anxieties, fears of failure, self-doubt, all these things. But I, again, you know, one of my favorite quotes is that courage is not the absence of fear or self-doubt. It is the ability to operate despite it. So, you know, it's human to have anxieties and self-doubt and fear. But, you know, you put it away and keep going. And usually things work out. But you can say, oh, wow, it's so different manufacturing to IT, to social sector, to banking or whatever. And yeah, they're very different. But the common denominator across all these is people. Okay. And the central challenge in any of these businesses and is getting people to work together across behind common objectives. And in every situation, you have people who have the power. And you want to make sure that the people with power and influence supporting you in achieving these objectives. So in a sense, different as the playing fields are, there is more in common than differences. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's a lot about, hey, in each situation, strategy and what you need to do and all is actually simple. The biggest, the central challenge is how do you get everybody working together behind what needs to be done? Okay. And I became reasonably good at putting together good teams that were able to accomplish a lot. I became reasonably good at aligning stakeholders who had the power and influence to make things happen or prevent them from happening to support what we needed to accomplish. And then you need a pretty good dose of good luck. And, you know, that's how it all worked out. So I approach everything from a people lens. Okay. What needs to be done? And how do you align people behind it? And to a very large extent, did educational background or your experience working in the US play a role in you succeeding in these roles or was it more of a mindset? No, I again, that's a super question if you unpeel it a bit. I think the important thing is what are called crucible experiences. You know, our entire lead, sort of mindset our skills, our self-confidence, self-belief grows from taking on big challenges and making a success of them, okay? And so when I look back, you know, what were the crucible experiences? One of them was leaving home when I was 17 to go to IIT, live in a hostel. Suddenly I was encountering people who were 10 times as smart as me. And so I had to somehow work harder to, you know, keep pace with them. That was a tough crucible experience. It was very good for me. Then I went to the US, this typical graduate student immigrant journey. I was there for 12 years and making a success of yourself in a new country, new society. That teaches you many things. You grow in your abilities, your self-confidence, you know, making shifts like going from being an engineer to running a large organization. Again, you have to learn things, moving from industry to industry. So each of these Big challenges tends to make you grow profoundly in your abilities, your mindset, your self-confidence, your networks, etc. And that's what I encourage people to do. So, you know, last few years, you've got lots of people trying to always, you know, be on the move. So they quit and they look for a 70% increase to do the same thing at another company. In the short run, this may pay off. Okay, financially, it may pay off because you're moving your uh, compensation very quickly. But very soon, you're going to hit a plateau. You know, if you look back at 
anybody who's achieved significant success professionally, you'll find that their graph is step functions, big steps after every few years. Okay. So you take on a new challenge, you spend a few years making a success of it, and then you take on the next challenge. The people who continuously on the move, like rolling stones that gather no moss, sooner or later, they'll run out of juice. So very true. And along the process, I'm sure you had your own encounters of challenges or failures. Sure. How did you deal with it? What mindset did you adapt to embrace some of these challenges? Or if you can give examples of working as a board member at Infosys. And I know at that point of time when you took over Infosys, it wasn't the best of the times. How did you deal with those kind of situations? See, this idea of you use the word failure, I think failure is a very powerful word and it's actually a toxic word, okay? The only failure in life is giving up, okay? Everything else is just a challenge, it's a setback, and it's an integral part of your life's journey, okay? The only time when you're not going to have challenges or setbacks is when you're dead, okay? So along the way, I've had plenty of setbacks in every role, okay? But what you do is... You get up, you dust yourself off and keep going. And usually, you know, if you're smart, you'll ask yourself, what did I learn from that? And how do I not make the same mistake again? How do I make new mistakes? So, yeah, so it's not just Infosys at Microsoft, at BOB, at my current role, I've made mistakes. I've had plenty of disappointments and setbacks. But, you know, you just tenaciously keep going and then suddenly people are applauding because it's a success. So I think that's really important. And the central thing about growth mindset is that you see setbacks and challenges as an inevitable and integral part of learning. And I give the example of a child learning to walk for the first time, age two. You try to stand up and you fall. Then you take stand up and then you take one, two steps, then you fall. You get up again, then you manage to do five steps, and pretty soon you're running. If the first time you fall, you say, oh, this is a failure, and you give up, you're never going to walk, okay? So children seem to not think about things as failure. They just see it as learning, and you have a good time (laughs) at it. I think we need to retain that childlike attitude towards all these things. Oh, that's very well said and a right phrase to use, not failures, but learnings, opportunities. Yeah. Very rarely is it a failure. So, Ravi, the famous Edward de Bono had this uh, famous six thinking hats. Now, Ah. uh, I would want you to wear a different hat, which is Ravi, the author. Yeah. And we would definitely, we did touch upon what the heck do I do with my life, your latest uh, bestseller. We would want you to talk a little more about it, peel the onion of uh, this particular book, particularly on areas that you have mentioned in the book around a portfolio life how AI is going to play the route over the next few years and much, much more. I want people to get back to reading. So, you know, I'm going to say, read the book. And one of the things that when I was writing this book, you you have a, as a writer, you say, what would success look like? And I wanted as many people to be able to read this as possible. So we kept the price really low. We priced it at two ninety five on Amazon. It's even less. So that anybody who af- can afford a cup of tea or coffee should be able to afford the book, okay? And those who don't like reading, there's an audible version. So I'm going to say, you know, if anything of what we have discussed is interesting, invest 250 rupees and go read it. But what is the central idea of the book? The central idea of the book is, look, we're living in an extraordinary time. You know, never in human history have we been in such a moment. It is best characterized by extreme change. The world is going to change more in this century, 21st century, than in all of human history. In all the previous 10,000 years, we have not seen so much change. And why this is happening is because we are in a perfect storm, which is created by the convergence of multiple forces, right? Technology, you talked about AI and fourth industrial revolution. That's propelling a set of changes. You know, you've got, on the other hand, the backlash of planet Earth, climate change, you know, mass extinction, all that. Then you've got demographics changing because human beings on average are living much longer and that has its consequences. Then you're seeing people's ideas and views about everything beginning to change. 
So you see the global world order is collapsing. So now it's a multipolar world with China, U.S., Russia, all competing for power and influence, and then other countries like India, etc., navigating their own path in between. You have very different ideas about, for instance, what sort of country do we want? You know, do we want democracy or do we want, you know, nationalism? Do you want, should we remain secular or should we become Hindu? Every sort of idea is out there being challenged and so forth. And so we're in a period of extreme change. The nature of work is changing. We're talking about remote hybrid. We're talking about, you know, no, there's no such thing as a job. Life is a series of projects, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you navigate this is very difficult. The cover of my book has a dinosaur on it because this is what happens when you're unable to handle extreme change. Okay, you become, you suffer or become extinct. And so my book is basically saying, Look, the things that were recipes for success in the past probably are no longer going to hold true. We need a whole different mindset, a whole different set of skills, and a whole different set of strategies to be successful in the 21st century. And here are some ideas for you to go think about. So that's what this book is all about. And I've divided the chapters to in around topics so you can pick up any chapter and read it. So you can pick up a chapter on what are the skills that really matter? Okay, and I say, well, there are four skills that really matter, I think. And it's not technical skills, but it is adaptive skills. Okay, so it's not machine learning and analytics and data science and all these things. It's actually learning agility, leadership, entrepreneurial mindset. These sorts of things are way more important than technical skills. What mindset do you need? Oh, I say, well, you need growth mindset, abundance mindset, optimism, whatever, self-belief. And then I try and unpack some of those things. How much is enough? This is going to be a central question that for all of us, how much money is enough? And when does, you know, it's money stop being an enabler of, you know, of your freedom? And when does it become actually shackles that enslaves you? And how do you answer that question for yourself? How do you define success? Right. Each of us has to finally come down to saying, look, what does success mean for me? So I unpack each of these in a chapter, but I'm not going to give away more because I want people to read. Absolutely. I second that and I will definitely leave the link in the show notes for people to pick it up for a copy on Google. While uh, Ravi did mention that he'll not speak more about the book, but I definitely want to ask two elements from that book because I read that and I find it really, really interesting. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners would benefit getting a take from you on these two elements. One is you mentioned something about you mentioned something around having a personal board. I definitely see a lot of value in this. I have been uh, practicing that to myself. Maybe for the benefit of the uh, listeners, you can dwell a little more on the personal board. And the second element, what caught my attention is your thinking around minimalism. It is not about being frugal, but it is about we caring for our environment by practicing minimalism. If you can just briefly touch upon these two elements, uh, Ravi. Sure. Okay, so look, we all know about companies and organizations that have boards of directors, right? What is the purpose of a board of directors? It's to make sure that the institution is successful. And when the CEO or management needs advice or something, there are a set of people with diverse experience you can go to and they'll share their views so that you can avoid making really bad mistakes. So that's the purpose of boards in companies. So I say that, look, apply the same thing to your own life. We're all going to go through this period of incredible change and you can make some really dumb mistakes, which can be quite catastrophic, okay? For instance, there's this opportunity, there's this new job. It sounds really exciting. Should I take it? Sometimes in these kinds of decisions, it's helpful to have a few other perspectives on on that choice. Okay, should I, I'm about to pick my life partner. This choice of life partner is one of the most consequential decisions anyone can make. And when you get that wrong, the rest of your life is just a mess. So in my book, I talk about the idea of snakes and ladders in our life. Okay, and the ladders like the game take you way up. And if you unfortunately hit a snake, you come slithering way down. And the point is, how do you assemble a set of people in your life whose judgment, experience is something that valuable? And how can you consult these people as you make these choices so that you make better informed choices, make fewer bad mistakes? 
And in my life, for instance, whenever I met somebody who I thought was had a really good, wise perspective, I remembered them. And when I tomorrow have to make a choice, oh, I'm leaving Microsoft to do what? Oh, I don't know, but I'm going to go out and figure it out. Should I do that? I'll ask five people and then, you know, make a better decision or whatever, right? So I think it is very important to assemble such a group of people in your life. It's a virtual board. They never actually sit together around your dinner table in your house and meet like a normal board of directors. But it's a set of people who care about you and who you respect and trust and admire. And that's the idea. In the book, I talk about how you put that together. The other one is minimalism. Look, I think when you're young, it's very normal to want to acquire things, right? So you go through that phase. Oh, you want a new audio system. You want the you know large flat screen TV. You want the nicest car that you can afford. And so there's a period of time where you're in an acquisitive mode. But you want to enjoy life, etc. And that's perfectly normal. But I think there comes a point where you stop and say, look, how much do I really want? Then you get on a path of trying to simplify your life. So there are many reasons for this. One is if you go on acquiring, you get to a point, ownership of things actually becomes onerous. It creates more anxiety than joy. Okay, you start suffocating on your possessions. And you first experience that when you have to move house after five years. Just the physical move is so traumatic and creates so much stress in the family that you realize ownership is no longer joyous. Okay, or you own three homes and it's giving you more stress with the, you know, renting it out and dealing with all those issues. And you realize, man, I better start simplifying. So one thing. The second thing is, look, the planet is falling apart. And the reason why the planet is falling apart is because we are consuming recklessly. Okay, And when you look at what is causing carbon, what's causing carbon is very simple. It's more people consuming more. And, you know, we can't necessarily change the course of the planet, but you can start making better choices as an individual. And so you need to start thinking about what is my philosophy around consumption going to be? And, you know, in most cases, if you start thinking about it, you'll realize, well, I need to use less and use longer. So today, the problem is we're constantly in a mode of a throwaway economy where you're buying things, throwing them away quickly or upgrading, etc. And you're creating this enormous ecological footprint. And we don't think about it, but you should. So you should think about buying from Amazon, how much packaging comes with that, or ordering food from Swiggy and Zomato. And look at, again, the packaging and wrapping that comes with that and all the footprint of the motorcycle guy who comes around. Think about these things. If you think for a minute, you'll start making different decisions, okay? And you'll start feeling better about yourself. I think we have given our listeners a food for thought on the question of what the heck do I do with my life? With that, we'll move on to the next segment of our conversation. Uh, Ravi, this is called as a power of three round, wherein I'll ask you a set of questions and expect uh, three sharp answers for each of these questions. Three sharp answers? Oh my, that's, that's a bit much. So if we are ready, we'll get started with the power of three round. Go for it. Great. The first of the power of three round, three routines that is unique to Ravi Venkatesh. Look, I don't think there's anything unique to my routine. I think there's some things that I do that are kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. So about five years ago, I bought myself a computer desk treadmill. Okay. One of those things where there's a stable desk and there's a treadmill attached. And I spend most of my working hours at that. I do most of my calls, this sort of a coding on a standing on that treadmill. I do all my typing, email, etc. on it because I like to get to 12,000 steps every day, particularly during COVID that was really useful. So I do most things and people are amused because I'll be on a call, walking, eating or drinking coffee and talking and typing at the same time. That's kind of funny. So the a second routine that is important to me is planning. I really, really pr- constantly prioritize and plan my time. So on a Sunday evening, I'll look at what do I want to accomplish next week. I'll go through the Stephen Covey two by two important in matrix and make a list of personally, what do I need to get done this week? Professionally, what do I need to get done this week? And I try to get to Saturday 
you know, having struck off most things. I start every day, every morning when I first thing I do is make a list of what do I need to accomplish today. I get that done even for the year. So I use OKRs, objectives and key results for, you know, planning what I want to achieve this year personally and professionally. So planning prioritizing is a routine I do. And a third routine, which I enjoy a lot, is at the end of every day, I sit down with a glass of red wine and I listen to music and I read, I unwind and it's a ritual. I don't miss too many days and it's a time of the day which I really enjoy, very precious. Usually I'm by myself. Very nice set of routines there. Well, this has to be the question that has to be asked of you, which is three book recommendations. Well, that's easy. The first one is, what the heck do I do with my life? Outside of that. I would say two or three books which have made a big difference to me. One was, again, Stephen Covey's uh, Seven Habits of Highly Influential People. It came out 35 years ago, but it is timeless. I think everybody can benefit from reading that. From a business book, i bored by business books, but one that I think has stood the test of time is uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins. So I highly recommend that. Again, timeless. AI can come and other things can come and go, but you know those ideas are still going to be relevant. And then a book that I discovered during COVID, which made a big difference, is by a lady called Aya Kema, and it's called Being Nobody Going Nowhere. And it's profound. Because all of us who are running around trying to accomplish things, trying to stay relevant, be successful, you know, you should read that one. It's beautiful. So those are three things I might suggest. Sure thing. Three best advice that you have received, Ravi, till date. Well, one of them from Microsoft, which uh, Kevin Turner, the COO, of my boss said, look, you'll go only as far as the team that you are able to assemble. So since then to pay attention to assembling a really great team with really great individuals and so forth. The second one is a piece of advice that I learned from Mr. Narayan Murthy. said, you, you must learn to disagree without becoming disagreeable. And you must encourage people to disagree with you without becoming disagreeable. So I like that. A third piece of advice I got was something that goes back to Wayne Gretzky. He says, you'll miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So in life, you should keep trying. And even if not everything works out, you'll achieve more than you would if you don't try. So yeah, so those are three good pieces of advice. I think pieces of advice there. You have been a prolific learner yourself. What are three practices that you take to keep learning from different sources? The first thing I would uh, say is, Try and shut down all social media, television, and all this stuff. It's mostly garbage, and it's highly addictive. It's full of false information, news, and random opinions. It's the biggest drainer of time and distraction and makes you up, leaves you making feeling upset about the world. So if you want to learn, at least stop the bad stuff. So that's really important. So in my book, I quote Eric Schmidt of uh, Google, who says, social media is an amplifier for idiots. And so it's, I think, one of the bigger barriers to real learning. The second thing is, it's really important to cultivate a reading habit, okay? Of course, you learn, we each learn differently. Some of us are better by learning through conversation. Some of us enjoy learning more by watching, you know, a TED video or something, you know, a YouTube video. But still, I think the reading habit is very important and it's not going to go away. And I recently learned of a great app. It's an e-reader called Libby. Basically, it's a free online library of all sorts of books. So that's a good one. I would say pay for your news. So subscribe to decent magazines and newspapers because you get what you pay for. This idea of free has turned out to be quite lethal to the world. Yep. Some tips here. Absolutely. Okay, the last of the part of three round, Ravi, which is if you were to give three advice to your older self, what would those three advice be? It's a good question because I'm about to turn 60. And you know, I'm like in a state of shock. Because I thought 60 is something that happens to other people. And in my mind, I think I'm still maybe 35, 40 or something. So I'm still processing this idea of older self. I try to reassure myself by saying, first of all, age is just a number. Okay. So that's one advice I keep giving to myself as I grow older. Pay no attention to the number. Just keep, keep on going as vigorously as you can. 
I do think that as you grow older, your body changes and slows down. And so it's important to pay attention to your health, health as well. So I've just come back, you know, since you asked at the beginning from two weeks at a Ayurveda retreat, I said, I'm going to turn 60 in top form. So, you know, paying attention, being more t- intentional to you about your health is, I think, a second one. And the third one is, look, you're living on borrowed time. So, Now, that's true. Even at 20, you don't know how long you're going to live. But certainly at 60, better start optimizing for time. So don't postpone doing the things that are important. Don't postpone doing things that you enjoy. You know, live life fully every day is a third piece of advice. And I'm not giving that. Yeah, this advice, I'm, this is genuinely how I'm trying to live my life. This is a fantastic way to look at it, make every day count. That's the whole essence of it. Yeah, and it's as true at 40 as it is at any other way. Great. Ravi, that brings us to the close of the power of three rounds. Fantastic responses. Thank you so much for that. So now, like I said, we are in the game of turning hats out here because you are wearing multiple hats. So I'll turn on to the latest hat that you're wearing, which is as chairman of the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, as well as the Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship. My question to you is, what is it all about? And how can listeners to this podcast play a role in what you have been doing? Well, first of all, let me explain what each of these are. So GAME is called the Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship. Global is still ambitious, still very focused on just India. As we all know, India has a big unemployment crisis and the unemployment rates are at a historic high, not since independence have we had so many people who are educated and looking for gainful job. And the answer is not easy because the reasons are structural. So we said, look, what we need is much more entrepreneurship. And what we want is millions of ordinary people, not just IIT, IIM people building lots of mundane, ordinary businesses, and not just in big cities like Bangalore or Gurgaon and Mumbai and Chennai, but in every corner of India. And that's the idea of mass entrepreneurship, i.e. it is widespread. And so our mission is by 2030, how can we create, you know, conditions that enable 10 million new businesses that create 50 million or more jobs? Now, we've been at it for four years and we're at, you know, a good point in our journey. We've figured out things, many things. We're about to now launch a number of states. The first state will be Maharashtra, where we're launching a Maharashtra entrepreneurship mission. Then it will be Karnataka, etc. We're also in dialogue with uh, Niti Aayog and Government of India to help launch a national entrepreneurship mission, much like Swachh Bharat was for toilets. As we begin to scale, there will be a need for lots and lots of people like our listeners who want to contribute, who are willing to give time to mentor these entrepreneurs, provide technical assistance of various sorts. But we're not yet at that point. So I think a year from now, we would have been able to create an up open architecture for volunteering. Today, if somebody said, I want to get engaged, I still wouldn't be in a position to say, "I okay, here, take this and run with it. But a year from now, we might be. The, glo- the second project is called the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. And it's basically a new entity or organization that came into being a year ago and which has got a mission to help low and middle income countries accelerate their transition towards, you know, renewable energy away from fossil fuels. Our goals are to eliminate four gigatons of carbon, give one billion people who access to energy today, they do, they're burning firewood or coal, charcoal or something for energy. They don't have access to electricity. So do that and make sure in this transition, we end up creating 150 million new jobs by 2030 or so. Just one year old, but we are have big ambitions. We're very well funded. Funders include Jeff Bezos through the Bezos Earth Fund, Rockefeller Foundation, IKEA Foundation, etc., able to raise about 10 billion in a capital. And we're working right now in seven, eight countries, including India, South Africa, Indonesia, Malawi, Congo. And yeah, so still feeling our way. It's just year one. So very young startup. Come to our website, which is called energyalliance.org and take a look. Again, we're in the same place where, you know, we if you want to volunteer, We still don't know how to utilize that offer, but probably a year or a couple of years from now, realistically, we should be in a better position. 
Fantastic. If Mrs. Malhot Sa is listening to this podcast, she would be very proud of her pupil of what uh, he has turned out to be. And like the Sanskrit word Ravi means putting the spotlight. So Ravi, through the course of this conversation, you have put the spotlight on all of us listeners into what you have done, what we can do when we have this question of what the heck do I do with my life. What a great conversation that was with Ravi. He shared how skills, mindsets, reputation can help you stay relevant during times of extreme change. He stressed upon investing in people, choosing the right networks, having mentors, building teams that work together for a shared purpose, assembling a virtual board of people in your life who can guide your decisions and so on. What stood out for me in the piece was the reference to the Pygmalion effect at the beginning of the conversation. And I think uh, that is something valuable to know more about and how to make it work. According to the Pygmalion effect or the Rosenthal experiment, higher expectations usually lead to higher performance. Now, Rosenthal, a psychologist, ran an experiment with two groups of his students who had to coach rats. One group was told their rats are specially bred and intelligent. The other group was told their rats are dumb. In reality, there was no difference and the rats were assigned randomly. Yet, surprisingly, later, the smart rats outperformed the dumb ones. Now, luckily, Rosenthal also conducted research with humans by running an IQ test at an elementary school in San Francisco. The teachers were told that some students were much more intelligent and competent than their classmates. But just like the rats, the lists were random. Eight months later, they ran another IQ test. And once again, the results proved that those who were expected to thrive did so. This showed that the teacher's expectations and the following behavior had an impact on the results of the students. Now, let me share a famous story from the early 20th century to just illustrate how powerful seemingly hidden expectations can be. Uh, so uh, there's William Vaughan Austin, a mathematics teacher and a horse trainer, managed to teach a horse how to perform arithmetic. The horse named Clever Hands would solve calculations such as adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing and share the result by tapping his hoof a certain number of times. Questions could be asked, you know, orally or in written form. And Clever Hands was right 90% of this time. And imagine, so the animal really became a sensation. Soon after, a psychologist, Oscar Foons, decided to investigate this extraordinary phenomena that this animal demonstrated. What he found was that when placed behind a curtain so he couldn't see the spectators or when he was wearing blinders, the horse could not manage to perform the calculations correctly anymore. The horse had never been counting. He had been reading cues from the audience to determine when to stop tapping his hoof. The more excited people looked, the close he could guess he was getting to the right answer. Now, if a horse can read human body language this easily, you can imagine how well we can pick up these cues amongst ourselves. By merely thinking that someone will perform well, you can increase their performance. This Pygmalion effect occurs mostly subconsciously. When someone thinks highly of us, we work hard to maintain those expectations. If someone we respect or want to impress, such as a parent, teacher, or employer, believes we will succeed, they can influence our own impression or of ourselves. Positive expectations allow us to take necessary steps to meet those high expectations. You know, we will we are more likely to push ourselves harder because we believe that we can achieve success. But unfortunately, this Pygmalion effect is not something we can activate by ourselves for ourselves because it relies on other people's expectations of us as a motive to succeed. So the million dollar question, how do we make this effect work? Simply put, 
we surround ourselves with people who believe in making big things happen. You need to be surrounded by people who believe in your capabilities and actively tell you that they expect you to do well. And that's how it works. When someone we trust expects us to do well, we naturally do better because we step up, we give our best, and we become a better, stronger version of ourselves. If you really want to use the Pygmalion effect to your advantage, you have to connect with people and build a social network who understand and respect your big, audacious goals and are more than happy to encourage you to take the right steps. This was about ourselves. Now, how do we make this Pygmalion effect work for others? Again, it is very simple. We celebrate others, so they learn to celebrate themselves. If we are in a leadership position, let's say managers, teachers, or parents, we should always maintain and express positive expectations because these expectations will actually impact how we treat those that we are supporting, as well as how those individuals behave. According to the Pygmalion effect, everyone has great potential. However, we need to believe in people and help them believe in themselves so they actually take action and move forward. Now imagine what would be possible if more people knew this and used it to spread encouragement and positive feedback. The truth is you might not change the world by encouraging a few people, but you might change somebody's world. So until next time, be aware of the Pygmalion effect that can help you gently push for the outcomes you wish for, both for yourself and for others. Before we sign off, this show is all about creating ripples of inspiration. What is uh, Ravi's Inspire Summer Today message for all the listeners? Well, it's a good question because it's the beginning of a year. Psychologically, when it's the beginning of the year, we all are attuned to thinking about what do I want to accomplish? What do I want to do with my life? Or what do I want to at least do this year? And I would say, look, I've thought a lot about this question. Why am I here? Okay. Like Mark Twain said, look, there are only two questions that matter in life. Actually, only two days that matter in your life. The day you were born and the day you figure out why you were born. I think the more you think about this question, the more you inevitably come to the conclusion that you're here basically to make the world you're here to make the world more beautiful in some way. And the trick for you as a listener is to figure out how am I going to make the world more beautiful in, in the way I uniquely can. So Shrika and somebody may be a singer. The way you make the world more beautiful is by singing or through your music. Somebody else is a painter or a poet. You'll leave the world more beautiful through that unique quality. So you have to ask yourself, look, what has the universe given me as my unique gift? And how do I utilize that to make the world slightly more beautiful and bearable than it is? And I'd say, go think about that and come to your own answer and act on. There we go. Bring on your unique gifts and make the world a better place. On that note, Ravi Venkateshan, thank you so much for taking time and sharing your life story, life journey, and those wonderful nuggets of uh, wisdom. Wishing you a fantastic 2023 and beyond. Yeah, Happy New Year to you and to all our wonderful listeners who've tuned in. Thank you for listening into today's edition of Inspire Someone Today. It's been a privilege to bring in these conversations. If you like this episode and have any feedback or comments, do mail me at inspire someone today podcast at the rate gmail.com. Inspiring someone is like creating ripples around us. If you like what to listen, feel free to share them and let's create ripples of inspiration. Do not forget to follow me on my Instagram handle at the rate inspire someone today podcast for all the latest updates. This is Srikanth, your host, signing off. And until next time, keep inspiring.